to understanding the hadith literature from the perspective of how, may, how a hadith has hukum behind it. So for example, in the hadith literature, we have on record today, give and take about and you do hajj and you give do zakat and you do uh, you know uh, the fasting in the month of ramadan this hadith is it have a hukum in it does it have a command in it no there's no command it's a jumla khabriya ikhbar it's just information there's no hukum by this hadith Remember, this is an issue that came up in your house. There's no hukum in Atu Zakah, is there? I agree with you, but a lot of people would disagree with right. you. Right. It would be Ida'i is Zakat. You have to give Zakat. Zakat is mandated in another ayah of the Quran. That's a deeper discussion. Where there Let the beard grow. Irfaluha is a command. But it's not a command. It's an encouragement. So how do you, dis like for example, all the muhaddisin will, and uh, not muhaddisin, but all the fuqaha would agree, the hadith in which the Prophet said, grow the beard, it is not tat'i, it is not definite. It is not like salah, you have to do it. No. This is a very important subject because both in the Quran, the understanding of how you know something is, has legislative
looking at his his eye. The same thing because of the balagha, because of the eloquence of language. The way, and you know Quran also primarily. The Quran is primarily primarily two languages. It is a language of literature. Not it is, you can say it has the asloob, has the style of Bashara and Anzar. Uh, there is uh, a hadith book that has a very good wordings. Uh, even if you look at the hadith books, like for example, Riyad uh, al-Salihin. Uh, is very eloquent for sure very eloquent as, as, as you will see in, because part of this has to do with eloquence but the hadith literature is not primary literary nor is the hadith literature primarily legal but it is you can say the asloob of Bishop That's not the book. Okay, anyway, there is a book that very precisely captures this idea that the sunnah of the Prophet, the hadith of the Prophet, is mostly to encourage people to go in one direction and stay away from the other. it would take away from the literary merit. The balagha would go away. Right? If the Prophet, for example, when the Prophet says, Wallahi la yu'min, or la yu'minu ahadakum hatta yuhibbu li akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsi. Right? None of you is a true believer. The Prophet's only looking at...
1,300 to 1,300. Okay? The agreed upon number of the ahadith that have hukum in that, there's qat'i hukum in this hadith, are how many? 1,000. It's a big number, by the way. Don't think 1,000. I don't know how many people... It's not looking at any of his other aspects. This is why you cannot base a hukum upon it, because a hukum is not based upon one aspect of anything. When you're giving a hukum, you have to look at many aspects of something. So, for example, uh, so, okay. So, understand the, the Prophet is talking like a prescription, like a doctor gives a prescription. Right? So when a doctor is giving you a prescription, he's only looking at that particular disease. And he's saying something only for that particular disease. Get it? Okay. So uh, this is the first point. Second is, uh, I'm going to now talk about a subject that's related to this issue. <coughs> and that is the role of aql in understanding hadith. This is very important. The role of aql. Because first of all, uh, anytime you read something, you're understanding it with your aql. The text is not telling you something. Your aql is telling you what the text is saying. The text is not talking to you. Your aql is telling you what the text is saying. Your mind, you two people may read the same saying of the Prophet and come to two different Conclusions. So who is talking? Not the hadith is not talking. The aql is talking. Right? The aql is in giving an interpretation of this is what the Prophet is saying. Some lies. Now, in this is very important because our general approach to hadith literature has to be, has always been, but not in recent times. Any time we hear a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, because the Prophet, our hadith, uh, you can say, attitude towards hadith has to be, the hadith has to prove itself to us. Not that we believe in the hadith blanket. We don't believe in the sayings of the Prophet, in, in something called the hadith, without like a blank check. There's no blank check for the hadith literature. There's no blank check. And the ulama of, uh, have, in fact, one of the strongest hadith that's in both Bukhari and Muslim, repeated many, many, and this is one of the most authentic hadith in all of hadith literature, meaning it has come from so many turks, so many directions this hadith has come that it's true. Uh, that is, the Prophet said, whoever says something on me, I have not said it, he's going to make a place for himself in the hellfire. So just giving all the hadith literature a blank check that the Prophet because we, you know, we feel hadith is sacred, so we give it a blank check, we should not do this. 
Hadith has to prove itself, even to the point, I will give you an, an example, from the time of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu an was told by Abu Hurairah radiallahu an. This is in the book of Imam Nimaja. Uh, Abu Hurairah radiallahu an says to Ibn Abbas that the Prophet did wudu after eating camel meat. Okay. As you know, there are some ahadiths that the Prophet did wudu after eating camel meat. Okay. So Abu Hurairah told this to who? Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas. Now, he's narrating what? An event that was from the Prophet ﷺ. What is Ibn Abbas's answer to Abu Hurairah? He said, this doesn't make sense. He says, this doesn't make, doesn't make sense. Why am I pointing this out? On the one hand, and you know this, had, had this surah is very interesting from both of these you can say extreme sides. One is, <laughs> Oh, you people who believe, do not raise your voices on, above the voice of the Prophet. So if someone says something, and he says, Rasulullah said this, don't argue at that time. But as far as accepting it is concerned, the ulama that take this ayah, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayuhalladhina amanu in ja'akum fasiqun bi naba'in fatabayyanu When some fasiq will come to you with some news and the, ex and the expectation is, this is why. Why is the Qur'an assuming he's a fasiq? See, the Qur'an is assuming he's a fasiq. If a fasiq comes to you with something, why? Because when you don't know the person, you don't know the person personally, and some news is coming to you from somebody you don't know, you have to approach it from a negative perspective. So on the one side, لا ترفعوا أسواتكم فوق صوت النبي Don't say, oh, this is not hadith, this doesn't make sense, and oh, what are you saying? Rasulullah would have never said this. No, this is wrong. But on the other hand, to you cannot just, as far as respect and other and honor and uh, etiquettes are concerned, if someone says the Prophet said something, لا ترفع صوت صوتكم أصواتكم فوق صوت النبي. But as far as accepting it is concerned, as far as giving giving it authority is concerned, you have to treat it as with doubt, until the hadith will prove itself to you. Let me give you an example, a very good example. Of sometimes, this is a famous narration of Sahih Bukhari. Where does this hadith come from? Sahih Bukhari. This is a Sahih narration from, from Sahih Bukhari. Now, this is what the difference between the fuqaha and the muhaddithin is. The hadith in Sahih Bukhari, which everyone knows, but now I will tell you what some of the usuliyin and the fuqaha they say about this hadith. This hadith is where? Sayyid Bukhari. Which chapter? Qasasul Anbiya. Okay? The hadith is that Malak al Maut and Jibra'il came to Musa. Musa punched the angel of death. When the hour death is never, never delayed. So the point is that from the perspective of the Asuliyin and from the perspective of the Fuqaha, they would say, this hadith cannot be accepted. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what He said is, is haq, 
and what he said is clear, and any hadith, any narration that comes in its place. Muhaddith would say, but the chain is strong. Huh? The muhaddith would say, because you have to understand how a muhaddith thinks. You have to understand how a faqih thinks. They think differently. You know, they, they come from two different worlds. And so, something very important and one of the things that's interrelated with the role of aql is something Quran calls over and over again ma'roof what is ma'roof huh? what is ma'roof established what is established what is well known what is in the human fitrah right what you know by human nature is that we sometimes downplay the role of oh you're talking your opinion you know you're, you're using your mind what do you mean this is the biggest gift Allah gave this is the biggest gift Allah gave you use this on the Quran you use this on the Sunnah of the Prophet and so when something does Rights. This is the question. Whose rights are being what? Invaded. Whose rights are being what? Invaded. Invaded. This is the question. In Islam, the most basic question is La darra wa la darar. Who is causing the harm? And what is causing the harm? How is this different? I'll give you an example from this illustration that I'm about to give. There's a man. He has a building. On the second floor, he has a window. Okay? 
Now follow this whole illustration. I know I've said this before, right? But I'm going to explain it in more with this principle in mind today. So there is this building. It has a window on the second floor. <coughs> Another man comes, he builds a house. And he puts a window on his second floor facing into his window. The neighbor doesn't like it. He goes to the, to the judge in America, says, this man, he's put a window on his, on, his, on his building. It's looking into the privacy of my daughter's room. I don't like it. The judge is going to say what? That's his right. That's his right. If you don't like it, close your window. The Muslim, now if you go to the Qadi, the Qadi will say, the question is, not whose right is what. If you go from the perspective of whose right is what, you'll say, well, this is his building, it is his right. This is his building, this is his right. I don't want to interfere in his rights. I don't want to interfere in his rights. So he has to, he, if he doesn't like his windows looking in, he can close his window. The Qadi will see who is causing the harm. And the Qadi will tell the man who built that window looking into that house, you have to remove that window from here and you can have it on any other side of your house. Now, second issue. There is a well in this, this house now also has a well, and under this well is the water. Everybody is taking it. Now, he builds a well, and his well is taking his water. Now, they go to the court in America, and this, the, 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 this plaintiff goes again, and he says, you know, he's taking my water, and can you please stop him from having this well? The, uh, the judge in America will say, well, it's his property, it's his water, he has the right to it. You cannot take from this <coughs> water. You go to the Sharia court and you present the case. The Qadi is going to ask what? what? What is the harm? There's no harm. No one's being hurt by this well that's here. It's being shared by everybody. If there is no harm, this is the question. Maybe in some cases there can be a harm. Because if there's less water or something like this. But if there's a lot of water, like you know in the villages in Pakistan and stuff, you, everybody's using that, the whole village. Right. If, the, if the judge sees it, there's no harm, he's going to say, no, he can have his well, and he's taking, the water is for everyone. The general principle also for water is that water is for everyone. So, the hadith literature, when we say hadith, we always look at the broader principles, and the broader principles, the, the subcategories of anything have to align with the principles of the broader Categories. If they do not align with the broader categories, they cannot be accepted. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna," And say good things to people. And the Quran also says, لَا جَهْرَ بِالسُوءِ إِلَّا مَنْ You can't say bad things to people unless you have been wronged in some way. Somebody's hurt you, so then you say something bad that's allowed. But now when the Qur'an says, قُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna," Okay, say good things to people. Does that give someone who has authority, like a cop for example, or some other person authority to be mean? No, it doesn't. Just because he has authority doesn't mean he can be meanful, right? So, the, the broader categories have more influence on the subcategories. Not the subcategories having more influence on the broader categories. This is very important when we are studying hadith. Hadith like in the Malamalu bin Niyat, La Adinu Nasiha, Al Khamru, Al Khamru, Sharr al Khabaith, or Umm al Khabaith, or you know, these are hadith of the Prophet that establish the main frame of the. Yes. You I just wanted to say another hadith that hmm. would relate to all of this for the general good. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, And he did not specify only Muslims. He said, الناس right. الناس So these, these, like this hadith, you know, follow the bad deed with the good deed. And this is general principles, right? They encompass the whole of the deen. So there's some sayings of the Prophet, they encompass the whole of Islam. 
And that is the significance of, of like hadith of like uh, uh, hadith of Jibra'il, hadith of Jibra'il when Jibra'il alayhi salatu wasalam came. So anyway, coming back to the hadith literature, on the one side, لا ترفعوا لا ترفعوا صوتكم أصواتكم فوق صوت النبي. When someone says the Prophet said something, don't need to say anything back to him because of not him, but because of the honor of the Prophet ﷺ. But on the other hand, something has to really prove itself to be a sahih saying of the Prophet ﷺ. So this is one point. Second point is that uh, <clears throat> when you are studying the Hadith literature, uh, what is what happens? What do you accept as a dalil? In other words, a hadith of the Prophet saying something, and a Sahabi a companion of the Prophet, or many companions of the Prophet doing something different. Which would be stronger for you? So this, there would be some difference of opinion on this issue. Some people will go with what the Prophet said. Some people will go with what his. His Sahaba, his Sahaba did the ijma of the Sahaba. In fact, in the Sharia, as understood by the ulama, is alaykum. Islamic law was vastly different from one another, very different. I mean, I mean, I don't want to go into it, but uh, you know, Umar, Umar was uh, very, uh, you can say, uh, he was very flexible in how he looked at the Sharia. He looked at what we can say the maqasid of the Sharia, the intent. who doesn't know this principle, he cannot be a Qadi. Because the basic principle of being a Qadi is the basic mainframe that from which he has to answer his fatwa is who is causing the harm. harm. For Western law, it is personal freedom and personal rights. It's my water, it's my property, I can do anything. No, no, no. What matters is who is causing the harm in Islam. أَتَجْعَلُوا فِيهَا مَا يُفْسِدُوا فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُوا Okay, so this leads to very vast understanding of law, you know, when you look at it from these two different perspectives. And so the, uh, when we're looking at any hadith that, for example, any hadith, now here's a hadith that we were just discussing last week. For example, the Prophet said, get married and get married and get married and finally he will marry somebody who a lady brings in a lot of risk. Now, is there a in this, this idea? 
Is there harm in this idea? The other ladies didn't bring the risk. This lady, she brought the... Because look, you're a Qadi or you're a Muslim. You're going to advise your brother. He's already, he doesn't have enough money to ha handle one wife. You're going to tell him to get married to a second wife? And then on top of that, a third wife? No, no one would, no one would do this. So if the Prophet did this, as this is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, this will be considered something specific to that, that companion of the Prophet ﷺ. That was specific to them, if it's a say hadith, but it cannot be applied in general, because the broader ahadith do not agree with such an attitude. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Because we will look at, do not cause harm. You're telling the brother to get married again, you're causing harm. We will never want to put our brother in a harm's way. And the Prophet, as far as I think of the Prophet, the Prophet would never put, never ask somebody to do something that would cause him harm and then cause him more harm and then finally there, there's something. No, this, so even a lot of it has to do with our uh, misinterpretation uh, when you don't keep these principles in mind. So, for example, the hadith that's in Sahih Bukhari, all of you have heard of this hadith where Ibrahim came to the house and Ismail had gone hunting and he talked to his wife and you know he divorced his wife. And then some people also took that hadith to say, see, he was poor and then he, he married this other girl, she, she, he became well to do, so the girl she brings her rizq. Well, both of them bring their rizq, not one's bringing their rizq, they're both bringing their rizq. The real thing was, is that the first wife was not pious. The second wife was pious. She was, uh, she had more piety. Uh, so that's the real issue, not the issue of that this wife will bring in more, uh, uh, more risk or something like this. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, and in your sky, in this, in the, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is your risk. So the, this, the, the other question is, okay, so you have a Sahabi doing something versus a saying of the Prophet Of course, you have the famous debate between Imam Shafi and Imam Abu Hanifa, in which Imam Abu Hanifa looks, when he looks at fiqah, he looks at what the Prophet did, not what he said. Meaning, in, in Canada, if there are two ahadith, and one is saying the Prophet did this, 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 in another hadith, the Prophet said this, this, this. Abu Hanifa will choose what he, what he did, his actions. What his actions are more important. Imam Shafi'i will say, no, what he said is more important. And uh, so, so anyway, there's. Uh, but if you had to do tarjih, if you had to choose between the two, Imam Abu Hanifa would go with one. The, uh, Imam, uh, Imam Shafi'i would go with the other. The point I'm trying to make here is that so one is. What a Sahabi said, or what a Sahabi did versus a Hadith. Second is, what do you do when an entire city of Muslims is doing one thing and a Hadith is saying something else? For example, the people in Medina, they do something, and a Hadith that Sahih is saying something else. Where do you go? The A'mal the al Medina, the people of Medina are doing one thing and the Prophet said something else. Where do you go? So the Dalil is not only Quran and Sunnah is what I'm trying to say. The real Qur'an is qat'i. In the Qur'an, it, the only argument with Qur'an is what is it really trying to say. And the ihkam in Qur'an are well known. If, the, if it's in Fair al-Amr or Kutiba alaykum al siyam and so on and so forth, this is a separate subject. But the lead, as far as hadith is concerned, hadith has to go, the hadith has to pass not only the test of Qur'an, it has to pass an internal test where the broader ahadith align with the subtopic and it also has to pass the test of of ma'roof, of aql, maslaha and mafsada. Maslaha is basically that is there benefit or is there fasad in this, in this issue, by this idea. So you cannot understand, and this is what's very important, you can never understand a hadith that leads to some sort of mafsada. That's not possible. Because Islam stands against everything that would do that. So for example, where the Prophet ﷺ said women are naqisul, naqisul aql. You can't understand it in the context except that the broader hadith fit into it. 
your interpretation has to be aligned with the broader. So for example, then it becomes important that the Prophet gave this as a khutbah on the day of their Eid, specifically to the women, and so on and so forth. And then from there we can discuss the psychology and different aspects. But this is not to demean uh, women. Muslim and so this type of uh, uh, I mean just in Arabic language that's just how it works it wouldn't sound good if you said Muslimat and then Muslim you know so anyway so then so you have ma'aruf you have aql you have the broader ahadith is this issue going to cause harm is it going against Quran there's maslaha and mafsada and then finally there is the issue of history itself. There is the issue of historical precedents. Because you see, hadith literature, for example, I'll give you one very good example. If you look at history, if you look at what? History. Historical accounts versus hadith. If you look at the hadith, you will may reach the conclusion Aisha radiallahu anha was seven years old when she married the Prophet. If you look at historical accounts, you will reach the conclusion she was in her 18, 19, 20 during that, during that time period. So when we say, this is why you have to understand that Hadith is a great masterpiece, intellectual inheritance, intellectual masterpiece. It is, it is phenomenal in what it has done in terms of collecting the sayings of the Prophet But we must understand that hadith is a human created product. And hadith has to go through many filters. The filter of Quran, the filter of your aql, the filter of the principles of Islamic law, the principles, it has to, it has to align itself even with history. So, it becomes very easy, for example, when you, uh, you know, my opinion is, for example, that Aisha the Allah and I was not seven years old when she married the Prophet. I don't believe this because it's embarrassing as a Muslim if, if I believe that. I don't have a problem with that. Wallahi, I don't. But I actually believe that. I believe she was not seven. I believe she was probably 18 or 19 years old. And so, but the, if you look at history, that's what history tells you. By the way, Aisha herself says, I was a jariha. Jariha means a lady in her teens. When I married the Prophet, this is her own words about herself. I was a teenager when I married the Prophet. So anyway, uh, so then you know there is the maqasid of Sharia. Maqasid of Sharia. You know how many maqasid of Sharia there are? Maqasid of Sharia. The intent of the Sharia. What Sharia wants? What does Sharia want to accomplish? There are five maqasids of Sharia. Number one, aql itself. To preserve the aql. In fact, let me put it to you this way. This will make it very interesting. Something is haram because something is haram. When we say masjid haram, what does it mean? The masjid that is sacred. Something is haram because something is haram. Something is forbidden because something is sacred. Nothing is forbidden for no reason. Everything is haram because something is haram. The Sharia wants to protect the aql, so all things that will affect the aql negatively become, like drugs, alcohol, at that level, they all become haram. This is not a lecture in Qiyas where how do you say from alcohol to drugs, but, uh, but all things... So there are five, you can say, muharramat, uh, five sacred things. And the sharia is there to protect those five sacred things. They're the higher intent of the sharia. I'll give you an example. Aql is one, life is the next. Doesn't matter, Muslim, non-Muslim, life is sacred. So qatl is haram, 
Life is also haram. Muharram. Life is sacred, so therefore killing is forbidden. The word haram means sacred, and the word haram also means forbidden. So, aqal, life. Now, I'll give you an example. See, this is where you have to keep the entire sharia, the broad view of the sharia in front of you. For example, in Saudi Arabia, there was a school, I don't know how many of you heard about this event. There was a school, the Kuliyat al-Banat or some, something like this. Uh, the college of the girls, it got on fire. The firemen came to put out the fire. The shurta, you know the shurta of Amr bin Maruf, Nayyad al Munkar? The, the police uh, for enjoining good for bidi, well, they came. And they told the firemen, you can't go inside. Why? Because women don't have their hijab. How many girls died? 200 girls died. 200 girls died and this is, now the whole world was talking about this is Islam. No, the maqab, you have to understand things are in their priorities. There are certain higher goals of Sharia. Protecting life is the biggest goal, amongst the biggest goals of Sharia. When the Prophet said on the Hajjat al wida you know, what day is this? What month is this? Which place is this? He said, Today, your lives and your property and your honor are sacred. Haram, that's sacred. This is what the this is what the Sharia wanted. The highest intent of the Sharia is life becomes sacred, the wealth of the people becomes sacred, their honor becomes sacred, so on and so forth. There are five of them. I will come to that. But this is the purpose of the Sharia: is to protect this. If you take like something of hadith or some aspect of Islam and you don't have the broader perspective, you're going to lose the intent of the Sharia, the purpose of Sharia. So aqal. Uh, haya, man, deen, deen, as far as deen is concerned, it, Muslims are to protect the synagogues and the churches of even the Christians. We are to help the Christians maintain their deen. And nasab, meaning your lineage. Your lineage is your right, your aql is your right, haya, your deen and uh, honor. honor. No, 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 no. Because the, the honor issue is is uh, is not amongst the five top. Even though that hadith, of course, the Prophet said it. But in that, that comes with aql and, and haya and some of the uh, it's their tangents. Of course, a person's honor is sacred in Islam. Don't get me wrong. But amongst it's amongst the top ten. The, the honor is amongst the top ten, but amongst the top five is your aql, your life, your deen, your mal, and your nasab. Honor and deen. So the point is, the sharia has levels. So when you look at an issue, it's not just a matter of this or that. Hadith, literature, you know, Quran is qat'i. There's no issue about the Quran. But when it comes to hadith, there is an issue of priorities. There's an issue of how to look at the hadith relating it to today. So, so there is, uh, <coughs> huh? Time is khatam again. So inshallah, I will end here. Inshallah, if you can turn that off, inshallah, then we will uh, continue next week. So uh, we will talk. About